change and roam in the living city. That's the plan for today. Not in bits and pieces, like in the previous module, but in 10 whole structures. Welcome again from your Roman Consul, Maria Cristina Saraceno. This is the problem we saw it last time. Most ancient monuments have been dismantled and recycled over the centuries and millennia. So if you have a look at the Roman Forum, which is a your first stop for ancient Rome, you will find a lot of ruins. But you don't want to see ruins, you want to see whole things. So some buildings still survive today only because they have been used for functions other than the ones they were built for. So this is what we are going to have a look at today. Adaptive reuse that save them from destruction. So today we're going to have a look at some monuments that originally were the Senate of Rome, some temples, some baths, some celebratory arches, some amphitheaters, and some mausolea or mausoleums. What were they reused as? They were reused as financial centers, churches, defense structures, and some others that we're not going to have a look at today were converted into haystacks, granaries, barns. This module is supposed to tease your imagination and open your eyes, and then I want you to have a look for more when you are in Rome. And have a look at how the past is living in different incarnations today. So it, let's start with financial centers. Meet Emperor Adrian. He reigned between 117 and 138 AD. His reign was famous for peace, tolerance, and he did a lot of traveling in the provinces. So emperors up to Trajan, which was right before him, conquered a lot of land. He said, let's stop for a second and rationalize what we've got. And uh, this is what he did. So his period was known for peace. And this is today, the Temple of Adrian in Piazza di Pietra or Piazza of Stone. You can see why of stone. And it's one of the most enchanting piazzas in the world. If I were you, when I go to Rome, I would have a cocktail or a snack right in front in this piazza in one of the beautiful bars that you've got. Where are we? We are in Campo Marzio, which is field of Mars. It is between the street of the main shopping street, which is Via del Corso, and the river Tiber. So it's a whole big area which in ancient Roman times did not used to be built. This is what the Field of Mars Campo Marzio used to look like 2000 years ago. It was just green grass and trees. So if you travel back in time, the fields were used for military exercises. And because of the risk of floods, they were built up later than the other areas. And they were built up mostly with beautiful temples and other public buildings. You know some of these temples already? You know the Pantheon, most likely. You know the Adrianeum or the Temple of Adrian, which is what we're looking at now. And then many other temples. But I, I'm just going to mention the temple to the Egyptian goddess Isis, which was right behind the Pantheon. And I'm mentioning this temple because a lot of people sometimes forget that there was a strong influence, not only from the Greek world, but also from the Egyptian world, especially after the times of Augustus. So other public buildings you know already that were built up in this area? We got the Theatre of Pompeius, next to Campo dei Fiori, and the Stadium of Domitian, which is today Piazza Navona. Many other public buildings were in this area. We might have a look at them in other chapters. What do you reckon the Hadrianeum is today? You've got three guesses. I gave you a hint when I told you it's a financial structure. The Temple of Adrian is the Chamber of Commerce. And you can see from the uh, board it says Camera di Commercio, Chamber of Commerce, Industry, Artisanship and Agriculture. Would you believe? So this has been a place for peace and money. The temple celebrated the newfound peace under Hadrian. But then, in the 1600s, it became the custom house. 
and in the 1800s it became the stock exchange of capital Rheim. And now it's part of the Chamber of Commerce. The best thing about it is that you can hire it out for your own functions. Come inside with me. It's, this one is a Made in Rome fair. Often the place is set up as a conference room. Today it's set up as a fair. You can have a look at the facade from the inside. You see all those holes. It's where the marble used to be uh, sucked to. Because clearly this was all covered up in marble. Would you host your next event at the Temple of Adrian? I would. That would be so much fun. Okay, let's have a look at churches. The best preserved ancient structures are those that have been turned into churches. Let's see five examples of those. This is the first one. It used to be a temple. What do you know about Hercules? Are you a mythology buff? Or did you just study it in school? Or did you watch the movies or the TV series? Well, Hercules is much much loved in Rome. You find him in every palace. Here he's at Palazzo Tam. Here he's at Villa Farnesina with a lion and with a hydra. And here you're at Villa Borghese with all of the labors on a sarcophagus. Here it's Hercules at Palazzo Massimo and I could go on and on. This is Lorenzo Colonna as Hercules at Palazzo Colonna. So why is Hercules so much loved by the Romans? Rome had a monster. He was called Caco. He was spitting fire, stealing sheep and cattle, wrecking havoc amongst the Romans and living in a cave on the Aventine Hill. What happened to this Caco? Well, Hercules, on the way back from his 10th labor in Spain, was carrying with himself the, the cattle of the monster Gerion. And he stopped over in Rome, as you do. Caco unwittingly stole the cattle, and so Hercules killed him and rid Rome of its monsters once and for all. But Hercules was much loved also because he was the god of commerce and the patron of traders and merchants. And this is the temple of Hercules Olivarius in all its glory. It has not been dismantled like the temples on the Roman Forum. And its columns have not been pinched. They are all there. This is how it used to look for centuries as a church. And you can see they built up in between the columns and it was all just used as a church. Originally it was built by an olive merchant next to the port of Rome and the market of Rome in the 2nd century BC, before Christ. That's about 2,200 years ago. It is the most ancient temple in marble in the whole of Rome. It only survived because it was turned into a church between the 1100s to the early 1800s. And the frescoes that you can see with the Virgin Mary and the baby and the saints are from the 1400s. But instead of the Virgin Mary, you should imagine a statue of Hercules there with his lion skin. This particular one is now at the Capitoline Museums. You can visit this temple, but only twice a month. And I put there the telephone number because it's a really difficult temple to visit. And it might be interesting for you. Where are we? We are by the river in front of the Mouth of Truth. You might have been to the Mouth of Truth, so you would know immediately where this temple of Hercules is. But for all of you who have not been to the Mouth of Truth, this is the usual altar of the Fatherland or the Big Typewriter, Big White Monument. And this is the Colosseum. On this side, you've got the Roman Forum. And you've got the river with its island, which is mostly used as a hospital. And uh, right next to the island, you've got to the Temple of Hercules. What used to be in this area in ancient Roman times? Three major things, lots of others, but three that I really want you to pay attention to. One is the Port of Rhyme, one was the cattle market, the Foroboario, one was the veggies market. So if you look in to that map, 
you see the river with the hospital island and you got the, te the temple of um, Hercules in front of the church of the Mouth of Truth, Santa Maria in Cosbedin. And right next to it, there used to be the kettle market, the veggies market, and the port of Rome. So big area for trade and commerce. So I encourage you to see this temple from the island or from the other side of the Tiber. Why? Because if you do, you're going to see the opening of the Cloaca Massima. What is the Cloaca Massima? It's the greatest sewer. And it's, it dates back to 600 before Christ. So about 2,600 years ago, would you believe? It runs under the forum and it ends up here. And this is what you will see if you're on the other side of the Tiber. You will see the bell tower of Santa Maria in Cosbedin, the church of the Mouth of Truth, the temple of Hercules, the broken bridge, and the exit of the Cloaca Massima. Now let's have a look at another temple. We are just right next to the one we've just seen. This one is the temple of Portunus. And guess who Portunus was the god of? He was the god of the port. It's right next to the temple of Hercules. This is a print of what this temple looked like as a church. And it was a church between the 800s and the 1920s when Mussolini decided to strip it bare and have it as a temple again rather than a church because he wanted to bring back the old splendor of Rome. You can see that he also built up around it and as you know Mussolini with his disembowelment took everything away, just destroyed a lot of buildings to make space for a more imperial Rome. This is the Temple of Portunus today. You can see it doesn't look anything like a church any longer. Restorations are a constant work in progress in Rome and they go on everywhere. Now, why am I showing you this temple? One of the reasons is that this is, it's got the shape of a standard Roman temple. It's got a high podium and a single staircase in front of it. You can see it's got a high podium and it doesn't have stairs all around it like Greek temples and the Parthenon. It's got a deep porch, freestanding columns, and a rectangular shaped cell. Why am I telling you these things? You can see it's got a deep porch, freestanding columns, and a rectangular shaped cell. I'm showing you these things because we're going to use them again and show you our Emperor Adrian has wanted to trick us and create a wonderful wow effect for us in another temple. You can only visit this temple of Portunus twice a month as well. Same telephone number. You can see how it used to be when it was a church. You can still see where the columns were as when it was a church. It was sent to Mary of Egypt for a, a, a fair few number of centuries before that was just St. Mary and uh, behind the columns uh, you can see there are some frescoes left you can visit the, the temple twice a month as we said just to try and call the same number as for the temple of Hercules let's have a look at the third temple you know this temple extremely well it is the Pantheon it's the temple to all the gods and it was not created as a church. It was created as an ancient Roman temple. It was the very first temple to become a church in the 600s, not 1600s, 600s. Emperor Foca donated the temple to the Pope, who, to thank him, erected a column in his honor in the Roman Forum. Why am I telling you this? Because this column has, is the very last monument to have been built in the Forum. After this monument, nothing was built, everything was quarried. Now the Pantheon is a much loved church to the Virgin Mary and the martyrs. During the barbaric incursions, many cartloads of bones of Christians were moved here 
from out of town cemeteries and buried in the crypt under the church to keep them safe for Judgment Day and so that the barbarians would not wreck all of the tombs. So we were talking about the wow effect that a famous emperor wanted to give you. Remember what the standard features of a Roman temple are? A high podium, and believe me, the Pantheon had a high podium. Now the ground of Rome has come up, so you can't really see it as much unless you looked on the sides of the Pantheon where you can still see it. It's got a, it used to have a single staircase. It's got a deep porch with three standing columns and a rectangular shaped shell, sh sh cell. Or does it? Let's have a look. What do you see? It's a perfect Roman style temple. There is what looks like a rectangular shaped cell at the bottom, at the end of it. There is a freestanding uh, columns with a deep porch and a stairs, staircase just in front of it. But if you go inside, it's not rectangular at all. It's circular. It's unprecedented and it is wider than St. Peter's Dome. Now, I said Emperor Hadrian wanted to trick you. And this is why if you just look at it from the front, you think you are in front of a standard Roman temple. Why do I say Adrian? It says Marcus Agrippa on the front. Did Marcus Agrippa build it or Hadrian? Marcus Agrippa was from a hundred years earlier than Adrian, uh, during the time of uh, Augustus. This is Agrippa. He indeed erected the first version of the Pantheon, but not the one that we see today. This is his best mate, Augustus. And so Hadrian wanted to be perceived as close to Augustus. And so he left Agrippa's name on the new temple he built, so that everybody, by seeing the temple, would associate immediately Hadrian and Augustus. Let me tell you a couple of interesting facts about Hadrian. He was not only a great emperor, he was also an amateur architect. He designed the Temple of Venus and Roma right next to the Colosseum. So if you are in the Colosseum, or around the Colosseum, or at the top, at the very top of the Colosseum, if you look towards the Forum, you can see a now part of a temple that is the Temple of Venus and Roma, which was designed by the emperor himself you are likely to find the statues of Hadrian's lover, Antinous, everywhere you go around Rome, much like Hercules. Watch out for him and his statues. You will also find statues of uh, Sabina, Hadrian's wife, all around the empire, a little less around Rome. And this is what Antinous looks like. He is here at Centrale Monte Martini, that is a uh, power plant reused as a marble statues museum and ancient uh, uh, mosaics. Here is Hadrian and Antinous at Palazzo Massimo and you can see the Pantheon from pretty much everywhere around Rome. So can you spot the Pantheon from here? You're on the Campidoglio, on the Capitol Hill. And yes, this is the Church of Jesus, the, the Jesu Jesuits Church. And here you find the very peculiar dome of the Pantheon. Here you are on top of the Vittoriano, the big white monument. Can you spot it? So you've got the Church of Jesus, or the Jesuits order here, and you find the Pantheon. Here you're a bit far further away, you're on top of St. Peter's. But still, if you look around, you see the big white monument and you see the Pantheon. So what happened to the Pantheon after the Italians invaded Rome in 1870? Well, the King of Unified Italy thought it was good enough to be their new family burial chapel. So if you go inside the Pantheon, you find the Vittorio Emanuele II, the father of the fatherland, um, who is the one you'll find on top of the big white monument that is Vittorio Emanuele II. And so the temple of all the gods became the temple to all the kings. 
and royalists like my mom still stand guard to the tombs of the kings. You find Umberto I, but you also find Queen Margherita. Margherita was much loved, and in her honor, you eat the pizza Margherita. Now, let's have a look at the Senate of Rome. It also became a church for a long, long time. The Senate of Rome was called the Curia Julia, because it was initiated by the Julia, Julia, Julian family, uh, Julius Caesar and Augustus, was the Church of St. Adrian from the 600s until 1938, where, when, guess who, Mussolini, stripped it bare of all its church bits and pieces and brought it back to its original splendor. Some of the frescoes are from one of the chapels of St. Adrian you can now see at, in, a in a museum that is called the Crypta Balbi, that used to be um, where one of the theatres used to be. Inside you can see the, the, the Senate of Rome is now a huge big room. It's used for art and history exhibition. Uh, you will find that if there is no exhibition inside, it's mostly closed to the public, but it's got original floors still to this day. And they have not been quarried out uh, simply because the Senate of Rome was a church during the period where everything was quarried out to build the new churches or palaces. This is a bit of a different thing again. These are baths, and they have been converted into a church by Michelangelo, none other. We are at the Diocletian Baths, so we are right in front of uh, Termini Station. They were built around the 300 AD, and they were majestic. They were the biggest in Rome and in the Roman Empire. Many Christian slaves are said to have died during their construction. All of this area, um, is now still standing because it was turned into a church. Michelangelo transformed a part of the baths into the Basilica of Santa Maria degli Angeli dei Martiri, St. Mary of the Angels and the Martyrs. This is uh, uh, the picture of one of the boards you find at the uh, Diocletian's Baths. And I wanted to have a look at it because this is the, 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 the plan of the baths. So you had a huge big area with a smaller area with, that was the actual baths. Um, the area that you see in orange, it's the area that is now a church, but you can visit most of it. So you can visit, if you enter from here, you can visit the M Michelangelo's Cloister, you can visit the museum that is in this area, and you can visit the church itself. You can also have a look at this round semi circular area that is called an exedra, and you can have a look at one of these two round areas, in particular this one which is now the church of San Bernardo. Stay with me, look around. This were the biggest baths in Roman, the Roman Empire, as I said, and uh, there's still a huge church. This is the part converted into church by Michelangelo. The structure is exactly the same as the, as the Diocletian's baths, including most of the columns. So when you imagine ancient Roman baths and the Diocletian baths in particular, this is what you have to refer to. Just take away all of the Christian designs and, uh, and just imagine those were the ancient Roman baths. Now, the Ezedra has been brought back to life in the 1800s by a very famous architect in Rome called Koch. I will show you what it did. So this is the area. These are the ancient Roman baths with the um, Michelangelo's cloister. This is now the church. And you can see the semicircular area, the Ezedra, and you can see one of those two round structures, the Church of St. Bernard. This is the Ezedra area. 
architect Koch recreated, uh, designed these two buildings to use the same space as it was used in the Diocletian spa. This area has been semicircular for at least 1,700 years. And this is the Church of San Bernardo. It dates back to Diocletian, not all the church things. But inside, if you have a look at the ceiling, it is still original from 1,700 years ago. And I love it. Let's move on to a different purpose. Defense. When you're in Rome, try and spot medieval towers. This one is the tower of the Colonna family. We're next to Piazza Venezia. This one is the tower, of, uh, we call it Tor Sanguigna, it's next to Piazza Navona. Right in front of it, in this building, you can go underneath and see the leftovers of the arches of the Stadium of Domitian. This one is next to Piazza, Venez the Piazza Navona as well, it's called Tor Millina. And this is the Tower of the Monkey, next to Piazza Navona as well. This was the Frangipane Tower. But you might also know him as the Arch of Titus in the Roman Forum. So this arch, unlike others, were not, was not quarried out because it was used by the Frangipane family as their own defense tower. Let's have a look at a mausoleum which was transformed into a stronghold. This is Augustus. It was the adopted son of Caesar. He was the first emperor and he was in power for over 40 years. Where was such a titan buried? He was buried in the field of Mars, the Campo Marzio, together with his family, his friends and later emperors until just before Trajan. So where are we? You got the river in the middle, you've got Piazza del Popolo with the trident, this is the usual Via del, Col del Corso, the street with the shops, and here you've got the mausoleum of Augustus. So 2000 years ago, this is a model of the, at the Museum of the Arapaci, uh, Patches the altar of the Augustan peace, and it includes the Arapaches here, so the altar of the Augustan peace, the sundial, ah, an obelisk with the sundials are all around it on the floor, and the mausoleum of Augustus. The area was not built up. Only this street used to be there, which is, guess what, Via del Corso, the big shopping street, which at the time was called the Via Flamini. This is the mausoleum of Augustus, if you see it today. It's a bit worse for wear, but it's still standing after 2,000 years, and it's in the heart of the living city. And it's round inside, and inside it's been used as lots of different things, quite surprisingly. So you used to get in from here. At the beginning, it was a mausoleum, and then it became the Colonna family stronghold during the Middle Ages but it also became a vineyard, a quarry for materials. As you can see, there is no more marble around it. An arena for bullfights, would you believe? A theater inside the round area. An hospice for the poor. And until 1936, it became a concert hall. So although you do not see any covering for that round building, there used to be until 1936, a huge big ceiling for the concert hall. And then Mussolini opened up the area around it to restore the mausoleum to its former splendor. Although it doesn't have all the marbles and the statues and the obelisks that it had 2000 years ago. This one is another mausoleum and it was transformed into a castle. Ta-da! Back to Adrian. This statue is at the Galleria Borghese. We are meeting Adrian a lot today. Where was he buried? He was buried just on the other side of the river, opposite Augustus. So, we have seen Piazza del Popolo, Via del Corso with the shops, this is the mausoleum of Augustus. The city was getting bigger, uh, Campo Marzio was getting built up, 
and so you couldn't build any more tombs on this side of the river so they just crossed the river and they went on the other side and this is the mausoleum of Adrian a bit wider out in the outskirts of Rome do you know what Hadrian's mausoleum looks like today or what is it called today this is what we now call it the castle or Castel Sant'Angelo Castle Saint Angel not just Adrian but many more emperors after him were buried here at least until uh, Caracalla after the year 200 AD. Step inside with me, have a look. So this is at the entrance, but from the 400s till the early 1900s, Hadrian's mausoleum was used for defensive purposes. So at the very beginning, um, the army was inside, the Goths were outside, and uh, there, it was not a defense structure, it was still just a mausoleum. So the, the army had to defend themselves and they took all of the beautiful marble statues, they hacked them up to pieces and they used them as weapons against the gods. So since then, you are able to find lots and lots of stone uh, cannonballs everywhere around the castle. There are plenty of weapons are still now to be seen. There's even a mill. But then it became the Pope's refuge in case of danger. And so in the 1500s it was decorated as papal apartments. And uh, for example, Pope Paul III of Farnese had this room decorated. You've got beautiful views on Campo Marzio on the other side of the river and on the Vatican and there is a secret passage for the Pope to use called the Passetto di Borgo that goes from the Papal Apartments within the Vatican to Castel Sant'Angelo and Hadrian is remembered even in the 1500s frescoes because he was the one who built this uh, structure and the first emperor ever buried here. Castel Sant'Angelo was also a prison, mostly for secret executions. This um, board says the courtyard of, of the shootings. But it was also used for fun and so like now in uh, most uh, capital cities with the river you've got river fire or fireworks on the river. Rome has had fireworks on the river for centuries and this is the traditional fireworks called the La Girandola at Castel Sant'Angelo. And you can see these paintings uh, in a museum that is called the Museum of Rome in Trastevere, which is one of those where you find all of the ancient traditions of Rome, together with the museum at Palazzo Braschi. Let's have a look at the last structure. This is an amphitheater, just like the Colosseum, and it just it was not for everybody it was just for the imperial court and it's been turned into defense walls so let's have a look at where it is we call it the little Colosseum but this is the usual Via del Corso with the shops this is the River Tiber the Mausoleum of Augustus and the Mausoleum of Adrian and the Vatican on the other side you've got the Roman Forum with a big white monument to the to Vittorio Emanuele II, the after of the fatherland, past the Colosseum, you still got to go in the outskirts, and you'll find this other little Colosseum. It's called the Amphitheatro Castrense, so the 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 amphitheater of the court, and it was turned into part of the Aurelian defense walls in 275, roughly you can see it it's right here and you can see the roman walls that went here and on the side and on today it's a vegetable garden of the friars and it used to be next to a stadium an imperial palace and more baths this is uh, contemporary arts meet the gladiators this is an iron and colored glass gate done 
by artist the Yanis Kunelis in 2007 and it's just the entrance of the amphitheater now. So what do you need to do when you are in Rome? You have to treasure hunt for ancient buildings which have survived thanks to their new functions and you have to relive the past. So for example imagine working at the stock exchange not at Wall Street but in the Temple of Adrian. Or imagine the bustling markets of Rome and traders bringing offers to their patron god Hercules. Or you can imagine the buzz from the port and sailors giving homage to the port god Potunus. Or you can imagine stripping bare the temple of all the statues to the gods and turning it into a Christian church in the 600s. Or you can imagine going to Mass in the Senate of the Roman Empire. How cool is that? Or even in the Temple of Antoninus and Faustina. This structure, so this one is the ancient Curia Julia, the Senate. This structure used to be the Temple of Antoninus and Faustina, both Emperor and Empress, and then after that, God and Goddess. But now, as you can see, it's now a church. Or you have to blur out all of the Christian iconography, iconography, and you are back in the majestic baths of Diocletian. Or imagine being a Frangipan and taking refuge in the attic of the triumphal arch of Titus, so inside this area here. Or you can imagine being the Colonnas fighting from their stronghold, where Augustus had buried his friend Agrippa and had later been buried himself. Or you can imagine being the Pope, fearing for his life and hiding in the castle where once great emperors rested. Or you can imagine being a friar, digging the garden for plant, to plant artichokes and finding the bones of lions and the tusks of elephants from the games. The limits of your experience are only the limits of your imagination. Once you got the groundwork, then you can build up from there. And your experience is going to be fantastic. The next chapter is a surprise. Come along for a new treasure hunt. Until then, arrivederci from your Roman consul, Maria Cristina Saraceno. Ciao, ciao.